It's a great honor to be able to introduce John Conway. Nothing more need be said. John, chemical pie. OK, so I'll introduce myself. Hi, I'm John Conway. Um, <laughs> right, so um, I'm going to talk about chemical pie. You know, Pi Day 2016 has gone by. And my, I still didn't do it. I'm determined to do it by next Pi Day. And I wondered, uh, and what, what, it, what, what it means is uh, learn the digits of pi, or some of the digits of pi, in what I used to call the elementary way. And then somebody came up with a much better name, I don't know who it was, chemical pi. You know, on Pi Day in various places, there are pie reciting competitions and also pie eating competitions. Um, chemical pie is a form of pie that makes it easy to remember pie, and it comes in mouthfuls and so on, and it's, it also helps you to remember the names of the chemical elements. And here there's a little bit of a mnemonic. Hi, he likes Beryl's boring car. Four, nights out. Well, let me perhaps spell nights that way. In florid neon. I don't know whether many of you have actually seen. This is a little bit of a mnemonic, which I have going all the way up. This is hydrogen. Here's helium. Here's lithium. Here's beryllium. Here's boron. Um, I'll explain why I sang that in a minute. That's carbon. Here's nitrogen. Here's oxygen his fluorine, and his neon. Uh, this mnemonic <coughs> goes on a long way. It, uh, it includes some elements that haven't yet been constructed. Uh, <laughs> but um, anyway, I'm going to tell you now, I'm going to give you a feeling for what chemical pie is like. And then I'm going to advertise it and tell you what it's good for. It's really good. <laughs> Here is chemical pi. Oh, I perhaps better note, it, note that when the neutron was first found, somebody remarked, I think it was PMS Blackett, that um, it could be regarded as an atom of the chemical element of atomic number zero. That idea had, had been, been had before Blackett, actually. Um, because, you see, it's one neutron, no protons, no electrons. That's and that chemical element, neutronium. OK, so here's chemical pi, a little bit of it. Three, neutronium, 14159265355, hydrogen, 89793828, sorry, 89793828, helium 2643381971, lithium 69, et cetera. Um, so I hope you sort of understand that. Uh, the, in between the chemical element of atomic number n and the one of atomic number n plus 1, go 10 digits of pi, the ones from 10n plus 1 to 10n plus 10. This is a really wonderful way of remembering pi. Uh, you ask me. I suppose you asked me. I'm asking myself because it would take time otherwise. Not, besides, I can ask a question. I know how to answer. Uh, you ask me what is, say, the 263rd decimal digit of pi. Well, 26. Uh, I know that's iron. Oh, 34603486101 cobalt. 346 is the 263rd digit of pi. So that's the first great advantage of chemical pi. Uh, it enables you to recite pi from any particular digit onwards. That's very nice. Um, so that's sort of showing off, which is a good, good thing to do. 
Uh, another thing is um, that uh, it helps with the, well, it helps to avoid the forgetting thing, to, to avoid forgetting. You see, if you just remember pi as a string of digits, uh, then, you know, your only name for a substring of those digits is that substring itself. And if you forget that, then you've forgotten what you've forgotten. Uh, and that's not much help. <laughs> what did I forget, <laughs> you know? Oh, I've forgotten. Um, but if you uh, forget the, the stretch between, um, well, between osmium and iridium, you won't forget that, of course, if you get there. Uh, but uh, if you just remember, you, you know, oh, I, I've forgotten that thing between osmium and iridium. And you look it up in my little paper to be published before next Pi Day in the Mathematical Intelligencer, uh, osmium, 49999, iridium. That tells you where the six consecutive nines in Pi are. Four, nine, 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 nine. The seven, six, oh, you have to know that osmium is element number 76. The digits six, 762 to 767. So it helps with the forgetting problem. It also helps with the stopping problem. I have learned and forgotten pi up to about a thousand places quite a few times. <laughs> uh, and the, the first time uh, I triumphantly recited it to a thousand places, it goes da 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 da, da 1989. Uh, and nowadays I say fermium at the end of that, but never mind. Um, but anyway, the first time I did it, I triumphantly recited 1989, and then, of course, I stopped. And the friend who I was reciting this to, if I can call him a friend, anyway, uh, he said, well, what's next? And, of course, being a mathematician, he knew that he, so to speak, wasn't allowed to go on saying what's next forever. Uh, but um, he had a good point, which was, I think, um, it's a bit odd to know all about the first thousand digits of pi and then to know nothing at all about the next digit. So I sort of solved that initially in a stupid way. I sort of thought, oh, well, I'll have 10% of play. So I remembered 1,100 digits. But then there was the play in the play. So I remembered 1,110 digits. And then there was the play in the play in the play, and so that took it up to 1,111 digits. Now, what's the play in that? That's some kind of fractional digit. Well, I asked my friend to look up the next digit of pi, not to tell me what it was, but to tell me whether it was five or more. The point about that being that that tells you whether you have to round up or down, you know. And um, and it's one bit, one binary digit, so my maximum at that time was 1,111 and a bit, places of pi and, and a bit. Um, however, this chemical method solves the stopping problem. A chemically pious person only needs to uh, remember the appropriate 10 digits of pi when to the satisfaction of the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, the nth chemical element has been constructed. That's very, very nice. Uh, the elements up to um, Copernicum, with number 112, there's a sissy pronunciation of that and a sissy spelling, which is Copernicium. I don't believe in that one. Anyway. Um, they were around for quite some time. On January the 4th this year, EUPAC, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry again, certified that four further elements had been constructed, 113, 114, 100 and They're not actually consecutive, so I'm a bit wrong here about what, what I was going to say, so I won't complete it. That means that the institutes that constructed them are allowed to choose permanent names. And um, 
as far as I know, they haven't yet done so. When they do so, I shall feel compelled to learn more digits of pi. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so that's a nice idea. Now, I may say I haven't actually done this. Pi Day has gone by, and I haven't done it. So I thought, what can I do to make it more likely that I will do it by next Pi Day? And I thought, well, one thing I could do is to, give, to find a whole lot of nerds and tell them about it. And then, uh, you know, there would be pressure built up on me to do it by next Pi Day. Where can I find a lot of nerds? <laughs> Unfortunately, I haven't got a very good idea. I think the answer is somewhere in this room, but I don't quite know. Anyway, so that's one thing. Another thing is I'm going to publish uh, in the Mathematical Intelligence uh, a little um, note called Chemical Pi, which is about half written already, and which states all these advantages for you. I must be nearly at time. What, how many minutes have I got? Oh, you've got plenty of time. Uh, no, don't say plenty of time. How many minutes? 19 minutes and, four, and 11 seconds. To, is that what's gone? Oh my God, what am I going to do? Ah. <laughs> well, I have a standard routine here. I tell a few funny stories, but never mind. Um, let, me, um, let me tell you the, the plan. Uh, I want to get all sorts of people who, you know, turn up on Pi Day and celebrate things uh, to uh, get to learn Pi the chemical way. And then you can do a wonderful thing. When my Russian wife and I, we, we both learn pi to 1,000 digits. Maybe I'll say something about that. Um, we lived at the, uh, at the time in Stephen Hawking's former house, uh, which he still owns, in um, Cambridge. And um, it's a tiny little house. And... Uh, we, uh, Larissa was um, writing a paper once, and she looked up from it, and she said to me, what's pi? 3.14, isn't it? And I said, Larissa, with your memory, she had the most fantastic memory, you ought to remember a few more digits than that. So she said, okay, give me 10, and I gave her 10. Oh, give me another 10, you know, <laughs> and so on. Uh, and then we, we both learned it to a 1,000 digits. And this was very nice on Sundays because we used to walk to have lunch in, in the little village of Grantchester near Cambridge, which is about uh, 15 minutes walk away, or shall I say a 1,000 digits walk away. <laughs> and we would hand pie over to each other. Uh, you know, I would say, perhaps I'll have to imitate a female voice, which certainly isn't going to be Larissa's. Uh, 3.1415, 9265, you know. We hand it over to each other and as we walk along the thing. What I'm hoping that the nerds who take this business seriously and learn pi this way um, will play that sort of game. And it's, it's really rather interesting. You can now say, for instance, nickel, 133, 936, uh, whatever it is, 1273, uh, copper. Um, sorry, that's, you know, nickel is the element just before copper. <laughs> um, so you can now ask a question by just saying a chemical element, and you're opponent in the game? Well, it's, it's not really a game with opponents. You know, your fellow player um, is required to say it. And if you have three people, it's really much better than if you have two. So whenever three friends are gathered together on Pi Day, well, it's a nice idea. I hope people will celebrate Pi Day in the, in the following way. At 1.59 on March the 14th, which is, you know, the official Pi Day, um, after giving thanks to the person who first thought of the idea of chemical pi, of course, um, <laughs> then um, we should play chemical pi, um, you know, in groups of two or three. 
it's actually rather better to have more than two people. And three, I think, is more than two. So you can... Um, that's right, isn't it? Yeah, OK. Um, so uh, the, the point is, if you have three or four people, one of them tends to go asleep a little bit while the others are busy reciting, and then you can zap him, you know. You just point to somebody. Oh, yes, you point to the person. Oh, by the way, uh, nerds. Um, what is the nerd salute? It, it should be clearly distinguished from the Nazi salute, so it's not sort of nerd power with an arm shot up in the air. It, here, here is what it is. Um, I hope you can see me. Well, you probably can't. Uh, if, if I lean right, no, I can't do that. It, the thing is, the salute is a point to yourself. And you say, nerd. <laughs> nerd. Okay, can we all have the nerd salute, please? Nerd. <laughs> it, it, perhaps it's better to have a weedier voice. Nerd. <laughs> okay, so... I hope you nerds will recognize each other uh, by that, yes. Um, we, we need, of course, it's a symbol of power as well, but we, we exercise our power in a, you know, we rather like to conceal it. Uh, yes, now wait a moment, I was going to say something very important. Um, Oh, the Pizza Hut thing. I didn't really want to do it in a, larger in a large audience. That problem at the end, the one about the jumble of key rings, um, it was a failure. It got mistranscribed or maybe misdictated or something. I don't know what it was. Uh, and uh, so it's a nonsense problem at the moment. I'll tell you what was behind it. Um, I can't remember exactly the wording I was planning to give for it, but the problem is this. Um, if you have a number of key rings which are perfect circles, think of them as two or three inches in diameter, all the same diameter. Um, and, well, perhaps I won't tell, tell you the problem yet. I'll just describe the thing. Then uh, you can have... Uh, it, well, the question is, can you have a way of arranging these key rings so that uh, any two of them look like any other two in the arrangement? The, strictly, mathematically speaking, the symmetry group is doubly transitive. Any two things can be taken to any other two. Other two. Um, and there are some two absolutely trivial answers. You can just have n separate key rings, not linked in any way, and then obviously any two look like any other two. Or you can take a torus, a perfect torus, you know, got by rotating a circle about a, a, a line perpendicular to its plane and not in it. Wrong way around. A line in the plane. <laughs> uh, and that... Um, that not many people know, I think, that a torus contains four families of circles, not just two. There's a circle you rotate in all its positions. There's a circle you're rotating it around, you're revolving it around, perhaps I should say. Those are the obvious circles. Let me call them the little and the big circle. But then you can also take a point on the surface of your torus and move it around the big circle, but at the same time turn it around the little circle. So that it go, as it goes once around the big circle, it also goes once around the little circle. And then its path, if you think about it, or even if you don't, because somebody else has done it, uh, its path is a perfect circle. That's the third family of circles. Uh, let's call that the one, one family. Then there's a one minus one family where you correlate the, the two senses of rotation in the other way. Um, now, if you take n circles all from that third family, then they're interchangeable. Any two of them look like any other two. 
Okay, now apart from those, which are the trivial ways of solving something, uh, there is a, a way of arranging five key rings and another way of arranging six key rings. Uh, what you do to arrange five key rings is uh, you, you rotate a circle around, well, I haven't done it properly. You rotate it around a point that's very near its perimeter. I didn't ta make, take this point near enough. And then you rotate it again, and you're rotating it through one-fifth of revolution, and you do it so that any two of the circles intersect. That's the projection of the object, and then you choose which string goes over in a suitable symmetric way, and you get what I call the pentalink, which is a link of five circles in which any two of them are like any other two. Uh, it's a rather remarkable link. And there's also a hexalink, namely, after you've done this, let me just sort of sketch it very badly. Um, you can have a sixth circle that goes through, down, it's out of, the, these things are nearly in a plane, the way I've drawn it, and the sixth one is perpendicular to that plane and goes through the hole in the middle and comes back around the outside. And it turns out that that also is doubly transitive, has this amazing amount of symmetry. And those are the two ones. And I tried to design a question which had those as the two answers. And it got mistranscribed, and I said something wrong as well. I'm sharing the blame. Uh, I don't exactly know what happened. So the question as posed was by pizza was absolute nonsense, and I'm just sorry. Don't say too much about that outside this room. <laughs> I'm, I'm really rather scared. I haven't communicated with pizza since that those problems went out. I wish I'd never heard of Pizza Hut, to tell you the truth. <laughs> okay. Um, yes? How many minutes now? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Well, I'll, I'll tell you another story, actually. This is so funny. This is uh, about what to do when uh, you finish too early. Uh, <laughs> It's got a self-referential character, as you can tell. Um, Alan Baker got a Fields Medal once, and he was terribly, terribly nervous. And this was, I think, at the Nice International Congress. And um, he had done some absolutely amazing work. And he was nervous about it, so he asked me to come into his hotel room, or the other way around, I can't remember which, and we borrowed a, an overhead projector and screen from the hotel, and he sort of went through his talk with me. And his talk, uh, he had a whole lot of carefully prepared transparencies, and any time I felt, you know, I wasn't quite sure what was up, I asked him a question and so on, and he carefully explained it to me. But then, when he was in front of this huge audience of, let's say, 4,000 people, uh, he went too quickly. Uh, he put his transparency on the thing and uh, pointed, said something about it, and then whipped it off before anybody could really read it, and put the next transparency on. And I tried to say to him, I hope some people can see me. You won't see me over there. I tried to say, slow down, slow down. I was sitting fairly near the front. But he never looked up. If he looked up, he would have seen his audience. And that would have frightened him tremendously. See, So <laughs> it was a good plan for him to <laughs> never to look up, except that it, it made him finish early. He finished his one-hour talk after 20 minutes. <laughs> and then he looked up. And you should have seen the horrified expression on his face, which I saw very clearly, because I was sitting right in the front. Um, he, he saw the clock, 
and he saw, um, you know, he'd finished his one hour talk in 20 minutes. What could he possibly do? And then he had a brilliant inspiration. He said, uh, thank you. And um, everybody applauded like mad. And as they streamed out, I heard various comments saying, what a wonderful lecture it was, you know. It wasn't really. The most wonderful thing about it was that it finished after 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and you knew that it was good mathematical work, even though you hadn't been able to follow any of it. So you, you thought it was a brilliant lecture, and you, know, you felt satisfied as you were streaming out. Uh, thank you. <laughs>